Well, today I pray that by the grace of God, that the words of prophet Isaiah in chapter 50 verse 4 will be fulfilled. Isaiah chapter 50 verse 4, can we read that? It says, the Lord God has given me the tongue of the learned that I should know how to speak a word in season. To him who is weary, he awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to hear as the learned. So by the grace of God, I'll be ministering on God, the helper of the weary. God, the helper of the weary. How do you know when you are weary? How do you know when somebody is weary? What does weariness, what does it look like? We cannot fully understand the title or the message without understanding what the word weary, what does it mean? To be weary means to be tired. It means to be exhausted. It means to lack enthusiasm. It means to be exhausted in strength, in endurance, in vigor. It means to be physically fatigued or mentally fatigued. I repeat those definitions again. It means to be tired, to be exhausted, lacking enthusiasm, exhausted in strength, endurance, vigor, or even freshness. It means to be physically or mentally fatigued. Similar words for, endure, uh, for weariness are to be worn out, to be drained, to be sapped, to be fed up, to be spent. To be worn out, to be drained, to be sapped, to be fed up, or to be spent. I don't know if there's anyone that is here that these words that I've just spoken describe how you feel today. But if there is someone here and you say one of those words describes how I feel, I want you to know that God has a word for you today. And that word is that God is the helper of the weary. Anyone that is tired, anyone that is worn out, anyone that feels spent, anyone that lacks enthusiasm, anyone that lacks energy, God says he is the helper of those who are weary. I want you to know that sometimes we think that we are the only one going through a season or a period. But I want you to know that what you are feeling, others are also feeling it as well. So that means that you are not the only one. You're not the only one feeling tired. You're not the only one feeling worn out. You're not the only one feeling exhausted. Others are going through it as well. Question, how do we get to the state of weariness? How do you get to the state of being weary? My simple answer is this. When adverse circumstances come our way, when we are going through difficult situations and they seem to be there for a long time, what usually sets in is we become tired. What usually sets in, we become worn out. Sometimes it will seem as if we have done all we know how to do. Weariness comes in when adverse situations, adverse circumstances, difficult situations, you find yourself in that place and you are wondering when would this season end? I remember the man called Job. How many people know the man called Job? The Bible describes him in such a beautiful way. It says that he's a blameless man. He's an upright man, one who feared God and shunned evil. But in one day, say to yourself one day. One day. Say to your neighbor one day. one day. In one day, his entire life changed. In one day. Let's read Job chapter 1 verse 13 to 19. We're trying to see how weariness comes in. It says, now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And a messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing, the donkeys were feeding beside them. 
When the Sabians raided them and took them away, indeed they have killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. Continue. While he was still speaking, that one has not even finished. Another also came and said, the fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I alone have escaped to tell you. And while he was still speaking, another also came and said, the Chaldeans formed three bands, raided the camels, took them away, yes, and killed the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another, by this time, most of you, you would have fainted. I believe so. Some people, they would just be pouring water. Revive, revive, revive. He says, whilst he was still speaking, another also came and said, your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And suddenly a great wind came from across the wilderness, struck the four corners of the house. It fell on the young people and they are dead. And I alone escaped to tell you. <laughs> How many people know that by this time, even the blood pressure, if they measure it in Job, the machine, what will happen to it? It will scatter. Because error, thank you. I thank you. Medical people know what will happen. If they put that machine on Job, the machine will just say error, error, error. Because one person in one day one event after the other event after the other event, in that state, that adversity or several adversities that have come into the life of Job, let me tell you, one of the ways in which you will know that you are weary, I want you to look at the words that you are saying. Examine the words that you are saying because we're going to look at the words of Job. Job chapter 6 verse 1 to 3. Job 6, 1 to 3. It says, Then Job answered and said, Oh, that my grief were fully weighed and my calamity laid with it on the scales. For then it will be heavier than the sand of the sea. Therefore my words have been rash. Job chapter 10, verse 1. My soul loads my life. That means I hate my life. That's what it simply means. My soul loads my life. I will give free course to my complaint. I will speak in the bitterness of my soul. Job 16, 15 to 16. It says, I have sewn sackcloth over my skin and laid my head in the dust. My face is flushed from weeping and on my eyelids is the shadow of death. Give me verse 20. Verse 20 of that same scripture, my friends scorn me, my eyes pour out tears to God. So we know definitely that adverse situation and adverse circumstances cause us to begin to speak in that state of we are tired, we are worn out. Why? Because of the things that are currently happening round about us. I want you to know that Job was not the only person that found himself in a state of weariness. David also found himself in such a state. Look at Psalm 6, verse 6 to 7. Psalm 6, verse 6 to 7. He says, I am weary with my groaning. All night I make my bed swim. I drench my couch with my tears. Has anybody been in that state? Please go back. Has anybody been in that state? When you are crying so much, if your pillow could speak, we say, please, it's enough. I am full, it's enough. Have mercy on me. He says what? I drench my couch with my tears. Continue. My eyes waste away because of grief. It grows old because of my enemies. Psalm 42 verse 3. My tears have been my food day and night while they continually say to me, where is your God? Who is saying to you, where is your God? The circumstances that are round about you. And if you're not even careful, the people round about you will still ask you, where is your God? Psalm 69 verse 1 to 3. 
Psalm 69, verse 1 to 3. Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in deep mud where there is no standing. I have come into deep waters where the floods overflow me. I am weary with my crying. My throat is dry. My eyes fail while I wait for my God. One of the signs that reveal that you are in a tired state, that reveals you are in a worn out state, is the words that come out of your mouth. Once you can look at what you are saying, you can judge whether you are tired, you can judge whether you are weary. I want us to look at one of the circumstances that put David in a weary state. We're going to read it in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 1 to 2. 1 Samuel 30, 1 to 2. It says, now it happened when David and his men came to Ziglag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziglag, attacked Ziglag and burnt it with fire and had taken captive the women and those who were there from great small to great. They did not kill anyone, but they carried them all what? away. When they took them all away, they also took the two wives of David. So I want you to know that David what is not in a good state. Look at 1 Samuel 30 verse 4. Give me verse 4, you see David's response. Then David and the people who were with him lifted up their voices and wept until they had no more power to weep. If all of these scriptures that I'm reading describes your current state, I want you to please follow me through to the end. If you find that throughout the whole week, all you have been doing is weeping. Weeping about your situation, weeping about your circumstances. The Bible says that David and his men, they wept to a point they did not have any more power. They did not have any more strength to weep because they had finished all the power to weep. 1 Samuel 30 verse 6. 1 Samuel 30 verse 6, the Bible says, Now David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him, because the soul of all the people were grieved, every man for his sons and his daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord. We're going to look at that word. Because when you are weary, you must know what to do. The Bible says that David strengthened himself in the Lord. Why didn't he just continue crying? That means that your tears, as good as they are, to help you clean from inside out, your tears are not going to solve the problem. That means that if you choose to cry from Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, if you keep crying, the tears are good for you. Why? Because they are cleansing from inside out. And even your eyes, you'll be like wiper. You are wiping your eyes, you know, like the. But you know what? There comes a time when you have to stop crying because you must know what to do. David is showing to us that tears can only take you to a place. They cannot take you beyond a particular place. So the next thing that David did, though crying, is to move to the next place. The Bible says he strengthened himself in the Lord. How did he strengthen himself in the Lord? I believe he strengthened himself by his understanding and his knowledge of God. I believe that David knew that whatever he was going through, God knew about it. I believe that David knew whatever he was going through, God had seen it. I believe that David also knew that whatever he was going through, God knew how to get out of it. I want you to know that your knowledge and understanding of God is what gives you boldness and strength when you are feeling worn out. That's why they say read your Bible. That's why they say go to Bible study. What are they trying to do? They are trying to give you more knowledge about God, give you more understanding about God, so that in the day of your adversity, don't be calling your pastor. Don't call me. I will not answer. (laughs) <laughs> yesterday people were calling me I didn't answer I was studying yeah. but the knowledge of God that you have in the day of weariness what will happen that scripture will come up 
And what would it do? It will strengthen you. Do you know what Job said? Job said, the Lord knows the way that I take. When he has tried me, I will come forth as gold. If you don't know that God knows what you are going through, how will you be strong? So when you are feeling weary, it is your knowledge of God that will strengthen you. So when they say, come for Bible study, you must go. When they say, let's study the word together, what are they doing? They are empowering you in the day of adversity. It's not in the day of adversity. You will say, which scripture? Like some of us. Please, who has a Bible? Please, I'm sure you all did this. Elder Bode, please. If you did this, confess your sins. Yes. In the day of adversity, you do like this. Then you close your eyes. <laughs> then you read, woe to the enemies of God. <laughs> Whilst you are looking for words of encouragement, you will just see war. Ah, no, 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 that's not what I'm looking for. Then you go like this again. The word of God is not kalo kalo. Huh? God's word is not gambling. You will just be doing, you will just close your eyes. Then you say, ah, this one does not favor me. No, 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 no. The reason why we ask you to continually come to the place of fellowship in your house, in your church, house fellowship, anywhere, is that as they're giving you God's word, what they're doing is it's like you are depositing. They're just throwing it up. Because in the day of adversity, it is what is inside that will come out. Thank you so much, sir. The Bible says he strengthened himself in the Lord. I want to beg you, you have cried enough. You can stand next week again by crying, but he's not going to solve it. David says there comes a point when the crying must stop. Then we go to the next thing. He says he strengthened himself in the Lord because he understood that God knew some things. I want you to know that God knows the way that you are taking. That was Job's confidence. That when God has tried him, he shall come forth as gold. Hmm. Then eventually, what did David do? The Bible says, he inquired of the Lord on what he should do next. He stopped crying. He encouraged himself. Then he said, God, what do we do next? He inquired of the Lord. Psalm 50 verse 15. Psalm 50 verse 15 It says, call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. Psalm 91 verse 15. It says, he shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. So when you are in that state of tiredness and you're worn out, you don't know what to do. That's the time and the season to ask Lord, what should I do? God has what you are supposed to do. The Bible says, David inquired of the Lord. Look at 1 Samuel 30 verse 8. 1 Samuel 30 verse 8. He says, so David inquired of the Lord saying, shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered them, pursue. For you shall surely overtake them and without fail you shall recover. Oh, thank you. Do you know what to do? As long as you don't know what to do, you will be tired. As long as you don't know what to do, you will be worn out. As long as you don't know what to do, you will be weary. It is your lack of not knowing what to do. That is what is keeping you in that state. The minute you know what to do, I'm telling you, you are coming out. The minute you know the direction God wants you to take, I'm telling you, you are leaving that space. So the tears must stop. You must strengthen yourself in the Lord. Then inquire, Lord, what am I supposed to do? Of course, we know when David started this journey, The Bible says that as he was going on the way, he met a man, an Egyptian man, and they gave him food and water. And I asked the question, why would a weary man who is thinking about his wives that have been captured, why is he stopping to look after someone else? 
God is very, I want to say, he's unique in his ways. You know, I wrote here a story and I have to tell you the story to explain this. Imagine two people. Bros, come, bros. God bless him. So this is a brother, he's praying to the Lord. You need only 20,000 naira, okay? So be shouting to the Lord. Be praying now, say, be shouting and tell God that you need. You need 20,000 naira, be praying. Lord, I need 20,000. Just 20,000 naira, that's all you want. Yeah, Lord, I ask for 20,000 Be shouting. Please, can somebody give him mic so he can be shouting? I want him to be shouting. Bring a mic for me. Oh boy, you cannot go to drama ministry the way you are doing though. I cannot, I cannot ask you to follow us. Be shouting and praying for 20,000. God is hearing you. Yeah, yeah, be shouting. Okay, dear Lord, I ask for 20,000 naira. Be shouting. <laughs> be shouting 20,000. He, he sounds funny. Please, I want somebody that's in drama ministry. Somebody should come down. Come, Jerry, somebody in drama. Hey, hey, come. Because this guy is, we cannot admit you into our fellowship. I want you to be praying to God. And I want you to be shouting. The way you'll be desperate for 20,000, just be shouting. Oh, yeah, yeah. Father, 20,000 naira. Uh-huh. Oh, wow. Uh-huh. 20,000 naira. Uh-huh. 20,000 naira. Hey. Oh, Baba. Hey. Give it to me. Give it to me. Give it to me. 20,000. I am next to her and I'm shouting, Lord, I need 20 million. Look, I need 20 million. Uh, Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Please, take the 20,000. Be going, be going, be going, be going. Be going. Be going. Can you imagine? You are here in God's presence shouting 20 million. Somebody is harassing the throne room of God with 20,000. You will collect the money. Oh yeah, just take. Be going, be going, be going, be going. The person should be going so that what? God can hear you. Huh? Just give the person 20,000. What is God telling you? Your own state of weariness is big. You see all those small, small ones that you are meeting on the way. It's better you are solving them all so that you can focus on God. God can focus on you. Are you understanding me? David met somebody that needs what? Bread and water. How's that one compared to my two wives? I beg, take the bread, take the water, be going. God will send people to you whose measure of weariness is nothing compared to you. When he sends them to you, it's so that you can have his attention. Please answer them. Let them be living the throne room of God. They should leave that space for you so that God can what? God focus on you. Because if somebody that needs 20,000 is shouting louder than you, and you, you need 20 million, you have to do something. Oh. God will bring people your way. Just little things. Just tiny things. Things that you will not even think about. Eh, you want rice? Is it rice? Don't worry, I will give you a bag of rice. Take, you go in. So that when you have answered that one's prayer, the one that you, you are asking God for. David said, I will give you bread. I will give you water. As I've given it to you, me, I have bigger fish to come and carry. I have two wives that I'm going to go and collect. Because many of us, our problem is we're so self-absorbed. We are so self-consumed. We are so into ourselves. A selfish generation. That you don't understand that in answering that person's prayer, you are answering your own. Because in David answering that guy's prayer, giving him bread and water, what did that guy do? He said, I will tell you where they are. This is where they are. Many of the prayers you are not answering. What are you doing? You are only blocking yourself. Many of the prayers, they are very simple. What you are simply doing, you are blocking yourself. Because if David had ignored that boy, 
he'll be stranded. And so, we're going to read Isaiah chapter 58 verse 8. Because God said something to David. He said, pursue, overtake, and recover all. In Isaiah 58 verse 8, Amplified Classic, it says, then shall your light break forth like the morning and your healing, your restoration, and the power of a new life shall spring forth speedily. Your righteousness, your rightness, your justice, your right relationship with God shall go before you, conducting you to peace and prosperity. And the glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. So I want you to get up. Go and hold the person next to you because you are going to pray. David, God said to David, he said, I want you to pursue, overtake, and recover all. And you are going to pray for that person. What is your prayer? That in the mighty name of Jesus, the hand that I'm holding, your light will break forth like the morning in the name of Jesus. Your healing and your restoration, the power of a new life shall spring forth speedily in the mighty name of Jesus. Your righteousness, your justice, your right relationship shall go before you in the mighty name of Jesus. I declare peace and prosperity. There is a restoration. I want you to pray restoration that the Lord will restore. They will pursue. They will overtake. They will recover all. Everything that has been lost, there is a restoration. There is a restoration. A restoration of lost things in the mighty name of Jesus. Everything that has been lost, the Lord will restore. The Lord will restore. The Lord will restore. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. As David pursued, overtook, and recovered all, so shall you overtake in the name of Jesus. So shall you pursue in the name of Jesus. So shall you recover all in the name of Jesus. Everything that you have lost, the Lord is restoring in the name of Jesus. He will restore peace and prosperity in the name of Jesus. The Lord will restore everything in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. So when you are going through a state of weariness, is there help for you? Does God know what you're going through? And does he care about what you're going through? Does he know? Does he care? Let's look at Psalm 94 verse 1. Psalm 94 verse 1. It says, he who planted the ear, shall he not hear? It says, and he who formed the eye, Psalm 94 verse 9. Psalm ni Thank you. He who planted the ear, shall he not hear? And he who formed the eye, shall he not see? I want you to know that God has ears to hear. He has eyes to see. He hears your cry. He hears your plea. He sees what you're going through. Psalm 56 verse 8, New King James. Psalm 56 verse 8, it says, You number my wanderings, put my tears into your bottle. Are they not in your book? I want you to give me that in Amplified. Thank you so much. It says, You number and record my wanderings. You put my tears into your bottle. Are they not in your book? Give it to me in NLT, please. I love this one. It says, you keep track of all my sorrows. Do you know what that means? When somebody is keeping track, that means what? They're keeping record. You keep track of all my sorrows. You have collected all my tears in your bottle. You have recorded each one in your book. The book of Hebrews chapter 4 verse 13. It says, and there is no creature... Hidden from his sight. Nothing is hidden from the sight of God. There's nothing that God does not know. So when you are asking yourself, can God not see? Does God not hear? Does God not know? I want you to know he says he knows. There's nothing you have gone through, you are going through, you will go through that you have to inform God about. 
And I wrote here, if God knows, does he care? Because it's one thing for you to know that I'm going through something. It's another thing for you to care about what I'm going through. Does God care about what we're going through? The answer is yes. Isaiah chapter 40 verse 28 to 31. He says, have you not known, have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Stop there. I want you to lift up your hands and pray. You're going to pray for yourself. This is what God does. He says he gives power to the weak, to everyone that is weak in whatsoever area that weakness is at this hour. I want you to lift up your voice and pray and say, Father, it is you that gives power to the weak. I'm asking in the mighty name of Jesus, in this area of my life of weakness, I'm asking for your power, that Lord, you will give power to me at this hour. He says, and to those who have no might, the Lord increases strength. I want you to pray that God will increase your strength, that in the mighty name of Jesus, as you are in his presence, God who gives power to the weak and to those who have no might, he increases strength, May the Lord increase strength unto you in the name of Jesus. May the Lord empower you in the mighty name of Jesus. Even the youth shall faint and be weary and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Isaiah 43 verse 1 to 2. We're looking at the question. Does God care? Yes, he sees what you're going through. He hears you, but does he care? Isaiah 43, 1 to 2, he says, But now thus says the Lord who created you, put your name, Abiola. Why didn't you put my name? So we're going to read it together. You're going to put your name. One to go. But now thus says the Lord who created me, Abiola. He who formed me, Abiola. He says to me what? Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. Let's go. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, they shall not be burnt. And nor shall the flame scourge you. Does God know? Does God care? Let's look at Psalm 103. Psalm 103, we're going to look at this in three different translations. Psalm 103, verse 13 to 14. It says, as a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. God knows our frame. He knows our strength. He knows our weaknesses. Let me tell you, you don't need to pretend before God. It's only before me you can pretend. Me too, I can pretend before you. But before God, you don't need to. He knows everything about you. Give us that, in, that same scripture in NLT. It says, the Lord is like a father to his children. It says, he is tender and compassionate to those who fear him. For he knows how weak we are. He remembers we are only dust. Give it to me in Amplified, please. He says, as a father loves and pities his children, so the Lord loves and pities those who fear him with reverence, worship, and awe. Praise God. Our question is, does God care? One more scripture, Isaiah 49. Isaiah 49, we're going to look 14 to 16. Again, three translations. Isaiah 49, 14 to 16. He says, but Zion said... The Lord has forsaken me and my Lord has forgotten me. Is there anybody there saying to God this morning, God, but it's like you have forgotten my name. It's like you have forgotten my address. It's like you have forgotten my number. Now God is answering you back. That's why I say God has a word for you today. If you have not heard anything of all that I've said, this one you must hear. God is answering you to everyone who says he has forgotten. God is saying to you, 
Can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Surely they may forget, yet I will not forget you. It says, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. It says, your walls are continually before me. Uh, please, who has Byro here? Who has Byro? Who has Byro? Byro, Byro, thank you. No, because sometimes people don't used to understand the word of God. God says that he has not forgotten you. And the way he has ensured he has not forgotten you is that he has what is called something to remind him. How many people have a phone? When you don't want to forget something, what do you do? You put it on your phone. You schedule your appointments. You schedule your meetings. You do pa 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 So that what? You will not forget. Now God now says that he has scheduled himself in order not to forget you. In order to ensure that he always remembers you. God is going to schedule you. How is God going to schedule you? He says, I have written your name. So I am God. Whose name should I write? Whose name? Please, I write my name first. Yes, I humble. I humble myself. I write my name. Sister Diola, because she's gentle, I write her name. God says so that he will not forget you in case he's very busy. He decides that he's going to write Adiola. Ade. Ade Bomi. Ah. Uh -huh. Any other name? Ike. So he says that in order for me to schedule you and not forget you, he says, I have written you in the palm of my hand. But if you look at that word, the Bible says in the palm of his hands. That means that if the left hand should forget, God now says, I have written, Adiola. Eh? Adepomi. Ike. So if the left hand decides that he wants to forget, what will happen? The right hand. God says that you are inscribed on the palms of his hands, not hand. So when he wants to forget, he cannot forget because every day, don't you look at your hands every day? So every day when God looks at his hands, he will just be saying, Abiola, Adeola, Abiola, Adeola, put your name if you're jealous. Abiola, Adeola, Abiola, Adeola. Ah! It's too much. So when you think God has forgotten you, he says, I have scheduled you. The same way you schedule on your phone and you can't forget, except that phone is, please, if you're not an Apple family, don't be angry, you know. But if you are the Apple family, you cannot, that phone cannot, cannot scatter. But God says, even if a phone should scatter, what will happen? He says, left hand, your name is there. Right hand, your name is there. Between left and right, the two of them cannot what? They cannot miss. So when you are saying God has forgotten you, it is impossible to forget you. And let me tell you something. I wrote Sister Diola's name in ink that when I go and wash my hands now, it will go. What he has written your name is, is in that blood. That blood that cannot be removed. That blood that cannot be erased. Nobody, nobody can get angry. I say, please, just remove, remove the, no, 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 no. It is inscribed. It is engraved by the eternal blood, by that ultimate sacrifice. It cannot be removed. Nobody can get angry and say, please, remove your last name. It's too late. You cannot, you cannot remove my name. Put your hands to the Lord, together for the Lord. I want you to know that God has not forgotten you and he cannot forget you. Look at Isaiah 49, 14 to 16. Let me just look at it in message. I'll soon round up. I'm going soon. Isaiah 49, look at 14 to 16. I like it in message. He said, but Zion said, I don't get it. God has left me. My master has forgotten I even exist. So some of you are even still thinking, eh, God has even said, I don't even exist. 
Then God says, can a mother forget the infant at her breast? Walk away from the baby she bought. Even if mothers forget, I'll never forget you. Never. Do you understand that? He says, never. What is never? What's the definition of never? Never. He says, I can never forget you. God says he can never forget you. You know, um, Brother Stephen Olusa was ministering this morning. There's a song that you sang. And honestly, I was listening to you at the back and I was just jumping. When I was coming this morning to church, it was the song that the Holy Spirit said I should put inside this message. And I was like, hey, okay, I'll put it later. You know how you're using it. Okay, I'll put it later. So when I heard you singing it, I knew it was a confirmation that God, I don't want you to sing the song. You just sit down quietly. I want you to listen eh, to that song. You will not sing because some of you, your voice is, is your signature in the spirit. You don't. Come here. I want you to listen to the words of this song. God is singing this song to you. Eh? It's like your, your, your time with God. And he says, I want to sing for you. Eh? Thank you. I want to serenade. <laughs> I have a father. He knows my name. Very softly. Thank you. He calls me his own. He calls me his own. He calls me his own. He'll never leave. He'll never leave you. He will never leave you. No. you to have the fullest assurance that God knows you that God knows your name that he sees each tear that falls and drops from your eyes he hears every time you call upon him he says he will never leave you nor will he forsake you He is your father. You are his child. He is yours forever. You are his forever. He says you are the apple of his eyes. 
He says he has loved you with an everlasting love. No one can take away that love. No one can reduce it. No one can diminish it. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. Now I want you to just say a gentle word to him. And say, Father, I thank you for your eternal love. Father, I thank you for your everlasting love. Thank you for choosing to love me. Thank you for choosing to know me. Thank you for choosing to accept me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you so much. You may go back to your seats. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you so much. I'm going to round up and I'm going to look at one more example. Before we round off, not round up. I'm going to look at one more person in the name of Hagar. I'm going to look at one more person in the name of Hagar. You can read the story yourself in the book of Genesis chapter 16. Because of time, I'm not going to read it. Go through it all by yourself. You know the story. Hagar was a servant who was given to Abraham and to Sarah from Egypt and Sarah had an idea that since she could not have a child that she would give her maid to Abraham uh, you know she didn't ask God she didn't consult God that was her own solution to their problem you know it reminds me of a film that I watched with my favorite Nollywood actor please if anybody knows him tell him I'm looking for him it's okay, don't be jealous. His name is Maurice Sam. So just in case anybody knows him, tell him Pastor Biola is looking for him, please. Anyway, in this film that I watched, it's called Before My Ex. I'm telling you this story because some of us, some ideas that we have does not make sense. So in this film, there's a girl who has a boyfriend. So she says she's not sure whether her boyfriend is trustworthy. So she now asked her friend, so go and tempt her boyfriend. And that if the boyfriend does not succumb, that means he's a faithful brother. So the boyfriend is a good boyfriend. He did not succumb. Should the film not have ended by then? So the girl now told her friend, okay, oh, my boyfriend has passed the test. That means the exam is over. Unfortunately, the girl they sent to do the test is now in love with the brother. So the problem now scattered. Because now she has to try and get her boyfriend from her tester. Her tester. God bless you. She has to try and get her friend, her boyfriend from her tester. Why did I say that? Sarah had an idea that it is good for her to give her maid to her husband. Was that God's idea? Some ideas that we have, what do they do? Rather than lifting us up, they are what? They are taking us down. Eventually, you know the story. Not only did Hagar move from economy to business class, she became a wife. Then she now moved from business class to first class. She now became what? A pregnant wife. At this point, and I say, even if you have not been on business or first class, you used to see it in the movies, am I right? So nobody can oppress anybody. Please, I've seen it before. Nobody can oppress me. So this woman was upgraded. But you know what she did? The Bible says that Sarah became despised in her eyes. And of course, that one dealt with her and she ran away it is where she ran to that I want us to quickly look at so don't mind all the Nollywood acting please drama ministry I want to join please I'm just putting out my application now so don't mind all my drama the major part we're looking at is when she ran away the Bible says that when she ran she ran to a wilderness 
And when she sat in that wilderness, what happened to her? Because that is where I really want to go to, and that's where I want to round up off. I'm going to look for it. Genesis 16, fantastic. No? Yes, Genesis 16, 7 to 9. Thank you. It says, now the angel of the Lord found her by the spring of water in the wilderness by the spring of the water sure. Continue. And he said, hey guys, Sarah's maid, where have you come from and where are you going? And she said, I am fleeing from the presence of my mistress. Can you imagine? You not call her madame. She is my mistress, Sarah. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress, submit yourself under her hand. Continue. Continue, just continue. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly so that they shall not be counted by the multitude. There's something I'm looking for there and it's very important. The name of that place is what I'm looking for. Can you go to the verse where the name of that place is called Be Beer Laha Roy. What does that mean? It says, for the Lord who sees me. For the Lord who sees me. If you read the second instance of Agar and her son when they were th thrown away eventually, you would see that God still found them. And you're probably wondering why am I telling you the story of Agar? What is so important about the story of Agar? I want you to read this in the New Testament. In the New Testament, the Bible says that Agar is not what of the free woman, she's of the born woman. So if the person that is of the born woman enjoys the ministry of the presence of God, enjoys the provision of God, enjoys the solutions of God, that anytime she is calling, an angel of the Lord will show up. Anytime she is calling, God himself will come up. If that person who the Bible calls a born person is enjoying all of that, and the Bible says you, you have a better covenant. You are born of the free woman. Why won't God show up for you? Why won't God show up for you? So when you are saying you are forgotten, you are forsaken, it is not true. Because even Hagar that we say is not of that covenant, the one that is passing away, the one that is slavery, the one that is bond, God says, don't worry, even the one that is born, they enjoy it. How much more you? In conclusion, what are you taking home today? Number one, God sees and knows what you're going through. God sees and knows what you're going through. Number two, God cares about what you're going through. God cares about what you're going through. When you find yourself in a state of weariness, strengthen yourself in the Lord. And how do you do that? By the knowledge of God that you have. What do you know about God? That is what will keep you in the day of adversity. So if you don't know anything, go and be reading your Bible. Number four, in helping others, you are helping yourself. In helping others, you are helping yourself. And finally, number five, the Lord God who made a way for Hagar, the Lord God who made a way for David, the Lord God who made a way for Job, that God is still alive today. He will make a way for you. Whatever it is, the circumstances, whatever it is, the situation, he will make a way. My final scripture is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8. He says, for we do not, okay, let me read it from here. For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure above strength so that we despaired even of life. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from such a great death, so great a death, and does deliver us 
in whom we trust we what will also deliver us. That means from that scripture, God is saying, I have taken care of your past. I have taken care of your present. And I've done what? I've taken care of your future. Do you understand that? So when God has taken care of your past, your present and future, which other dimension is left again? Everything is covered. Do you understand that? Every single thing is covered. I want you to know as you are going home this day, again, if you have not heard anything, you will hear this one. Your past, your present, your future is covered by God. Your past, your present, your future is covered by God. There is no area, no season of your life that God has left undone. There's not one. Not one is uncovered. Every area is covered by God. So when you find yourself worn out and tired, when you find yourself in that state, you will know, your, your words will tell you that you are worn and you are tired. Those words, they will reveal the state of your heart. When you find yourself, it is the comforting words of the scriptures. That's why I say, with the comfort with which we have received, there is comfort in the scriptures. Knowing fully well that God says, I have you covered. So we're going to do one more thing. We're going to pray for each other again. Because I believe sometimes when somebody is weak, the person next to you can have Holy Ghost fire. So I want you to please rise. We're going to pray. Hmm? I want to raise one or two prayer points for us. We're going to pray two prayer points. Pick a prayer partner. Pick somebody that can pray. No one says you could do well, mama, please, my brother, can you pray? Because the way you are doing that time, I was doing like, the way you are doing, I don't even know if you have capacity. Can you pray, my brother? Can you pray? You cannot pray. I don't want this place. No, brother. Hello. Uh, where is your wife? She, your wife should come and pray with you because me, I cannot, I cannot. Please. Uh, this man's wife, this man, this man, that man is there. Please go and pray with your husband. Come down. Come on. I cannot pray with him. No pray, he cannot, he cannot act, he cannot pray. So what's your point? Okay. Oh boy, bring your hand. Go and hold your husband. Your husband says he cannot pray. Oh yeah, go, go. We are waiting for you when you get there. Get, get. At least you can pray with your wife, Abby. Yeah, see how you are smiling sheepishly. Hey, oh Jeff for you. You are smiling sheepishly. We are in the presence of God, nothing can happen. Hold your wife. Ah, okay. Between romance. <laughs> I do that. I think I work by me. We're going to pray two, three prayer points for ourselves today. Mr. Brown, please hold Mrs. Brown well. I don't like the way you're holding her. Hold her romantically. Uh -huh. Isaiah chapter 41 verse 10 is our first prayer point. Isaiah 41 verse 10. He says, fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. He says, I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. I want you to pray those words to that person. That God Almighty will reject the spirit of fear over that person's life in the mighty name of Jesus. We declare in the name of Jesus, you will not be afraid. You will not be dismayed. God is with you in the mighty name of Jesus. The Lord will strengthen you in the name of Jesus. The Lord will help you in the mighty name of Jesus. The Lord will uphold you with his righteous right hand. Lord will thank you because they will not be afraid. Lord will thank you they will not be dismayed. Lord will thank you because you will strengthen them and you will uphold them in the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus we pray. In the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Our second prayer point is taken from Genesis 21 verse 19. When Hagar found herself in the wilderness, herself and her son, they lacked water. For three days the water had gone. And they sat there, but God showed up. And when God showed up, the Bible says, God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. She went and filled the skin with water and gave the lad a drink. That hand you are holding, you are going to pray that God will open their eyes. 
that divine provision. God is opening their eyes. That divine provision, the Lord will provide for you. Whatsoever that area of your life that you need provision, the Lord God Almighty will provide. That area that's causing you to be weary, the Lord will open your eyes in the name of Jesus. The Lord will open your eyes in the mighty name of Jesus. The Lord will provide for you. The Lord will provide for you. Lord, we thank you in the name of Jesus that the Lord will provide. God will open your eyes. You will know what to do. You will not be confused. You will know what to do. You will not be confused. God will open your eyes. You will find water. You will find water. You will find water in the name of the Lord Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus. And your final prayer point is taken from the book of Corinthians that we just read. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, uh, verse 1 to chapter 1, 8 to 11. It says, God who has delivered, God who does deliver, and God who will deliver. I want you to pray for that person. Your past, your present, your future, they are secured in God. Your past, your present, your future, they are secured in God. Your past, your present, your future, they are secured in God. Your past, your present, your future, they are secured in God. Your past, your present, your future, they are secured in God. Your past, your present, your future, they are secured in God. Your past, your present, your future, they are secured in God. In Jesus' most precious name we pray. In the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Somebody give the Lord a shout of praise. So as you go home today, I want you to know that God knows you. Is anybody persuaded that God knows you? Fully persuaded. Be fully persuaded. Father, we thank you for your word that you have given to us. Thank you for grace to deliver that word. Thank you for every heart that has heard that word. Thank you for grace to receive it. We receive it by faith and the grace to walk with it. Grant unto us. Lord, this we ask and this we pray. In Jesus' most precious name we pray. Amen, amen and amen. God bless you.